Welcome to the uh, Sports Medicine Research Rundown um, with uh, my co-host Rob Shapiro and our special guest, Dr. James Pacey. Um, Rob, wh- Rob Shapiro, why don't you introduce Dr. Pacey for us? Um, you have the pleasure of working extensively with the Mountain Long Island. I haven't had that pleasure as much in uh, in Westchester, but uh, so we know a lot about them from uh, the crew at a- ASMI and uh, and the orthopedic surgeons there that uh, that have uh, I've interacted with at AOSSM. So, Dr. Pacey. I want to give a little quick thing. So, I've um, known Dr. Pacey for probably since he started, which is, sounds makes me feel old like my friend Scott over here. But um, Dr. Pacey did his first, went to Yale, then eventually went to Chicago Medical School, received his medical degree. And then um, after that, he has residency at SUNY Upstate Medical, um, chief resident there. And then one of his, he was a fellow, which was pretty amazing at the American um, Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, with Dr. Andrews and group. Um, come back to Long Island and just, you know, every other patient, who are you going to see? Dr. Pacey. So, you know, we've had the opportunity over the years to see his surgery. And just the cool part with him is having somebody who's such a high end locally that we can definitely send to and see different level skill care that's coming back. The surgeries are coming back are kind of unique, what we've seen on the island. And it's kind of, so nobody, people don't have to go to the city anymore because we have Dr. James Pacey in group, but great to see you. And uh, let's talk. Rob and Tim, thanks a lot. I appreciate the invite tonight and uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Outstanding. Um, I thought first we get started, we distributed the research article to all our participants tonight. I thought we first start with a discussion about the uh, the ulnar collateral ligament and the increased incidence in our young athletes. I have a I have a research article in front of me that actually shows that the the incidence of uh, of of ulnar collateral ligament tears in throwers has gone up sixty two percent from nineteen seventy four to twenty twenty four in the last fifty years. That's a sixty two percent increase. But the disturbing thing is that the age is a 12, there's a 12 or 13 percent de- decrease in age. It used to be that players that tore their UCLs were around 27 years old, according to the study. And now the average age is 23 years old. Is that kind of what you're seeing in your practice? Is it is it getting is this not a a disease or problem in just professional baseball pitchers? Is it the younger athlete now that is getting UCLs more and more? What do you see, doctor? I think we all see the the professionalization of the youth athlete. Um, you know, my my mentor, Dr. Andrews, has been a big prom- proponent of fighting single sport specialization. And it's clear that overuse leads to the majority of these, if not all of these injuries, um, especially in the youth, youth athlete. And most of these should be preventable. We know all of the things that, that you can do to protect the young throwing arm um, from damage. And we see everything from, you know, medial epicondyle avulsion fractures that start as little league elbow. And kids don't listen to their body and, and don't tell anybody that they're hurting. And they're given a ball to throw and they're going to throw it. So I see in my practice probably a dozen medial epicondyle avulsion fractures a year. And everything up from there to partially UCL tears, to full UCL tears, to, you know, middle school and high school kids with disease in their UCL up to professional athletes. But I think the reason that we're seeing it more and more at the youth level is single sport specialization and year round baseball. And if you look at statistically where most of the major league baseball pitchers come from who have never had UCL surgery, the Mason-Dixon line literally is a stripe in the sand. And those who grew up north of the Mason-Dixon line have a decreased risk of having Tommy John surgery compared to those that live south because of the ability to play year-round. Now we're catching up with them with our indoor facilities and 12-month travel baseball. But clearly, it's linked to volume. I want I want to heard a quote by Dr. Keith Meister uh, at a conference, and he said, "The best baseball pitchers that we see are the kids who weren't baseball pitchers growing up." 
They, right. they the, were the classic. The classic story is Mariano Rivera. He didn't start pitching until he was 19 when he was in college. He was an outfield. Wow. I didn't That's know that. why, he, you know, at the, towards the end of his career, he tore his ACL shagging fly balls in the outfield. He used to shag fly balls every day because he was an outfielder at heart. <laughs> right. And I That's use that example in my office every day with patients. You know, yeah, it's great. Your kid's 11 years old and he can throw harder than everybody else. Well, guess what? Statistically speaking, he's not going to last, especially if he's in my office already with arm pain. And and arm pain's a problem, and the ulnar collateral ligament is probably one of the weakest links in the th in the pitching arm. And in the old days, correct me if I'm wrong, but Frank Frank Job. Uh, Frank Job, who kind of invented the surgery, is that true? In 1974, the the guy, the pitcher, Tommy John, who was a Dodger, then was a Yankee. Tell me about that surgery, and is that how you learned with Dr. Andrews doing the the Tommy John surgery? So it it all started out in L.A. and Dr. Job actually had experience as a polio surgeon, um, and had experience um, with some of the guys in his group treating patients with polio. And they did a lot of tendon transfers. And the idea for the classic UCL reconstruction came from that experience treating polio patients. And Tommy John was at the point where he just, he couldn't throw any longer. And Dr. Joe came up with the original technique, which involved a figure of eight graft using a Palmaris autograft. Um, in his initial procedure, however, he took the entire flexor pron pronator mass down off the medial epicondyle to expose the ligament. What he didn't do at that first surgery was address the ulnar nerve. And because of, likely because of that big exposure and the scar tissue formation, Tommy John actually had a terrible post operative course initially and wound up with a claw hand from his ulnar neuritis. And they had to go back in and unroof his nerve and move it. Um, so the, the original Tommy John surgery then move forward to having a, a submuscular ulnar nerve transposition. And the complication rate of that was very high. Um, so that's where things began to evolve with the procedure from not taking the entire flexor pronator down. And that was Dr. Andrew's real con contribution was lifting the flexor pronator and doing a bit of a muscle split as opposed to taking the entire flexor pronator down. Um, as well as using an ulnar nerve transposition that was subcutaneous rather than submuscular to avoid those complications. Um, he used the Palmaris longest. Is that what um, surgeons are still using today? Have they moved on to different types of grafts, or is it still the Palmaris long longest in in reconstruction? So the, the Palmaris is still in the workhorse. Um, some physicians have transitioned over to hamstring. There are some physicians using allograft. Um, there's really not great data on allograft at this point. Granted, it is technically an, an extra articular ligament. So like the MCL or the MPFL in the knee, you may be able to get away with allograft. But classically, palmaris is used. You can harvest it from the same arm. It's one surgical site. If they don't have a palmaris, usually we go to the contralateral leg the land leg and take a, a gracilis graft from there. Um, but that's something that's evolved with time. You know, if you, when I was a fellow, if you talked about graft, everybody thought that the hamstring graft was going to be better because it's a bigger graft than the palmaris. But what we actually found is the return to play rates were actually worse with the hamstring than with the palmaris. If you look critically at the literature and it probably has to do with the fact that it is a bigger graft and it takes longer to incorporate. Um, and Patients probably aren't patient enough to give that graph the time that it needs to fully incorporate. But there are certainly times where you have to use it. And when you were a fellow down there with Dr. Andrews at a ASMI, were they um, were they taking down the uh, FCU like you talked about, or were they splitting it at that time? I know that it, you you taught me that he he developed that split technique. Is that correct? Right. So there's there's two different muscle split techniques, right? So. Yes. The original, the original Job technique took the tendon and everything right off of the epicondyle and basically windshield wipered it up. Okay. The Andrews technique splits the fascia of the flexor pronator and you split the muscle a little bit distally, but then you raise the, the roof basically off of the ligament from posterior to anterior and you're working basically from the cubital tunnel anteriorly. The modern muscle splitting approach 
does not violate the cubital tunnel at all and splits in the rafe between the anterior two thirds and the posterior third of the muscle. And that drops you directly down on the UCL. And that's a very utilitarian approach if you don't need to address the ulnar nerve and depending on the technique that you're using. So if you're doing a docking technique, you can do it through that muscle split. If you're doing a figure of eight, you need to access the opposite side of the epicondyle. Um, and that basically means you have to enter the cubital tunnel at least partially. Where that modern muscle splitting approach comes in and is terrific, as we talked about, is in repair. All right. And I know we're going to get to repair, but mm -hmm. if you don't need to address the ulnar nerve and you're really just addressing the ligament, when you're doing a, a direct repair with an internal brace, that modern muscle split is a phenomenal approach. You just talked about the docking procedure, and that was kind of the progression that I have read about in the literature, that the docking procedure was the next step. Can you tell us a little bit about the docking procedure and how that made the surgery a little bit better? All right. So really, this was Dr. Alchek's contribution. and. The difference there is instead of on the humeral side having to drill three large tunnels, you drill one large tunnel at the footprint and then two smaller tunnels that suture come through. And you're basically tying suture over the bone bridge as opposed to in the figure of eight where you take the tendon, you lay the tendon over the bone bridge and then sew it to itself. It's a technique specific thing. Um, I honestly, when I do reconstructions or I'm doing hybrids now in those situations, I use a figure of eight technique um, simply because that's the way I was trained. That's the way I'm most comfortable with it. And I think I can get better tension on the graft using a figure of eight. I also feel like if I have a long enough graft, I can then get a third strand back um, more consistently with a figure of eight than a docking technique but again it's it's surgeon preference um sometimes these palmaris tendons aren't the best tissue at the ends and my fear is if you're relying on whip stip a uh, which uh, the whip stitched suture within the tendon mm -hmm. and you pull on that too hard sometimes it pulls out right and if you're relying on that as your primary fixation that's a concern for me in that case maybe you need one of the linear me methods that's uh, documented in the literature like dual interference screw or endo buttons or something of, of that sort of nature. Um, right. So like every other orthopedic procedure, there's 8 million ways to skin this cat. Um, in terms of interference screw fixation, that was the Dane procedure that Chris Ahmad popularized. And if you looked at the data from that, they did comparable, but not quite as well in terms of outcome compared to docking and figure of eight. The docking and figure of eight techniques have very similar outcomes across the board. Okay. And uh, the, the double docking technique, do you remember that one? So docking, double docking, oh, interference screws, right? Endo buttons. These are all different fixation methods, right? So you're adding a suture button. Where are you putting the suture button? If you put it on the humeral side, there's concern for irritation of the ulnar nerve. If you're putting it on the ulnar side, if you aim wrong, you can have impingement issues between the ulna and the radius, right? So these are adding levels of complexity to what's been a very successful procedure, right? If you look across the board at classic figure of eight modified Job with the Andrews technique or the docking technique, return to play rates are around 90% or better. In the, yeah, right? in the 90s. Across totally. the board. Right. Yeah. So, so in that regard, when we're looking at different techniques for reconstruction, we're, we're playing a game of, is it an easier technique? Is it a more reproducible technique? Right. Or are we just adding complication and adding cost mm -hmm. for no reason? Right. The classic docking and the classic figure of eight, there's no implants. It's all suture. Right. Okay. You're drilling holes, you're passing a graft, and it's all suture. You add an interference screw, you add cost. You add a button, you add cost. And if the outcomes are similar and we're not getting to 100% return to play, are we really moving the needle? And that's where the real jump has been repair with internal bricks. 
One question, one question before we go on to repair with internal brace for you, if you don't mind, is the the um, thought process preoperatively or interoperatively to move the nerve either submuscular or subcutaneous. What's the thought process on that? And does doesn't everybody move the nerve? Won't that be stressed during pitching? Uh, so the please. indications for moving the ulnar nerve. Let's start there. First, it's symptoms, right? Do you have numbness and tingling in your fingers when you throw? Yes or no? Then on exam, do you have a stable on the nerve? Probably 20% or more of the throwers that I see that require Tommy John procedures have an unstable on the nerve, right? You flex their elbow, you can feel right behind the upper condyle, and you feel that nerve roll right up over the edge. I know because mine's been unstable probably since I was playing high school football and high school baseball, right? But you feel that ulnar nerve, and if it's unstable, it's getting transposed at the time of surgery. If they have no ulnar nerve symptoms, right, their nerve is stable, don't go near it. Okay. Especially if you're doing a repair. Now, depending on the technique you use for reconstruction, you may be obligated to move the nerve. So using that modified Job figure of eight, Andrew's technique, you're entering the surgical field through the cubital tunnel. We moved every ulnar nerve when I was a fellow, right? And when I do a classic reconstruction, I move the nerve. When I do a hybrid, it depends on which approach I've taken to get there. And we'll get to that decision-making a little bit later. But if I'm doing that classic approach, I have to move the ulnar nerve I'm obligated to. But we have techniques now that you don't have to. And then when you talk submuscular versus subcutaneous, submuscular has proven out to be a bad idea in overhead athletes. Um, mm -hmm. the, the complication rate is too high. Then you get to the, sub, to the subcutaneous techniques. Then it's a matter of what leash you're going to use to hold the nerve in place. We classically use the intermuscular septum. You can release it from proximal distal to the medial epicondyle, and it's a nice little tab that you just throw right over the top of the nerve. You put it nice and loose so the nerve glides. There's plenty of space. It's just a check rein to make sure it doesn't fall back into the cubital tunnel. And surgically, you can close the cubital tunnel so that doesn't become an issue. That being said, there's still a certain complication rate associated with ulnar nerve transpositions. Some are going to scar in. Occasionally, somebody has to have a nerve decompressed after it's been transposed. We don't focus as physical therapists as much on mobilization of the nerve and the in the Tommy John uh, throwing reconstruction. Maybe we should be. What are your thoughts on that? I, I'm wondering should, the should nerve, we address that? Absolutely, nerve glides after yeah. that procedure are 100% not only appropriate but essential um, to avoid that complication. Excellent. That's something I, I don't I don't often do it, but I appreciate that insight. Um, now let's move on to what we're going to talk about tonight, and that's this new procedure that we're hearing all throughout the media and uh, professional baseball and college baseball, um, the, in, the internal brace. Can you tell us what your indications are and also um, how you do the surgery? Sure. So Jeff Dugas really pushed the needle on this um, and pushed this forward. Um, originally, if you look back at Art Reddick's papers and some of the early papers on, on UCL repair, the outcomes were terrible. Um, they were trying to sew the ligament back to the bone through bone tunnels or trying to sew the ligament back to itself for mid-substance tears. And the outcomes were very poor. And that's what led back to reconstruction. Um, Buddy Savoy started doing some repairs with suture anchors. And these were unilateral tears, either from the humeral side or the ulnar side. And he put a suture anchor in and basically tied the ligament back down. This was no internal brace there, but his outcomes actually started to be pretty good. And then the internal brace procedure really started in the foot and ankle and then the knee. And Jeff Dugas took it into the elbow and said, well, this is working everywhere else. It works for MCL tears in the knee. Why don't we try this in the elbow? And he did the biomechanical work to prove the biomechanics behind it, went into the lab and did it right, did a small cohort of patients, followed them, and gave us outcomes data. And 
the reality is it's a terrific procedure and it's had a tremendous success rate at this point. And essentially what it is, is doing a combination of a primary repair to a suture anchor, either at the proximal or distal end, and then a collagen dipped fiber tape, which for all intents and purposes is a shoelace. It's a woven okay. suture. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you close the ligament back up and you bring that down across the top and plug it in on the other side. And what the internal brace does is it load shares, but it doesn't over constrain the joint to the point that the native ligament can heal, but it has this seat belt while you're rehabbing. So it doesn't stretch during the, the rehab process. And to a certain extent, the magic of the procedure has been that it's cut return to play times back almost in half. Now, I've made some changes over time in terms of technique, in terms of materials that I use. The original technique used a round super suture, a fiber wire suture. I've gone to using completely tape type suture, so flatter suture. It doesn't pull through the ligament at all. That round suture can giggly saw a little bit. I've taken some stuff from rotator cuff repair surgery where there's a technique called a speed fix where you pass suture through the rotator cuff and then dunk it into an anchor and put the anchor in place. So on my repair side now, I drill and tap the socket for that first screw that holds the internal brace suture. But rather than putting another suture in there with it and then back passing and tying it down, I dunk that and speed fix the ligament. And that gets me a much stronger repair, I think, and allows me to dial in the tension on the repair a little bit better. Um, so little, little changes like that have gone a long way. And, you know, you can look at Jeff's data over 90% return to play at or above previous level in multiple sports. We went back and looked at two years of my patients and we had a hundred percent of my patients return to previous level of sport. Um, and that was from professional athletes, including a professional boxer all the way down to high school throwers. Um, so we've been very successful with this procedure and, you know, it allows us really to help the kids that have a limited time to play, right? So you tell a high school kid, it's going to be 12 to 18 months before they return to baseball. You're going to have dead loss there. Let's call it kids that aren't going to have an opportunity to play again. Right. Or yeah. halfway through, they're going to get bored and go, you know, baseball is not really that important. To me. Right. Whereas uh -huh. if you put them on a six to nine month return to play for a pitcher and for an infielder, five months, right? Four and a half, five months. It's amazing the, the opportunity that you're able to give these kids. Excellent. Would you do it in a contact athlete, like a wrestler or a football player or a gymnast? Or if, if the same indications were there on the MRI, I will talk about, I'd like you to talk about the MRI and the physical exam next but would you do it as a contact athlete absolutely and i have and you know cheerleaders the gymnasts when sure. they truly have that unstable elbow they do terrific they really do um and again that's that athlete is more akin to the knee mcl injury right they're right. posting on that on that ligament they're not repetitive over and over throwing yeah they're, they're walking on their hands to a certain extent but uh -huh. They also can go in an external brace when they return to sport that a pitcher can't, right? So I, right. Can, I can protect them even further after surgery, and that helps in that dynamic kind of walk-on-your-hands type athlete. Um, so, but what are we looking for? It's, it's expanded in my practice. Anybody is a candidate for it as long as, number one, the MRI looks right. <clears throat> The exam is true that that's what your problem is. And three, when you get there, that is at the time of surgery, there's sufficient tissue to perform the procedure. Anytime I indicate a patient for a repair with internal brace, I also indicate them for a reconstruction in case they need it. And over the last 12 months, what that's meant is a repair versus a hybrid where we internal brace with the reconstruction. And that's okay. really the future. So on, on MRI, what I'm looking for is, is it torn? Where is it torn? How badly is it torn? And, and 
Tears can happen in three places, proximal, mid-substance, and distal. Mid-substance is the least likely to happen. It's very rare that these tear right in half um, unless they're traumatic. Proximal has the best blood supply. So that's the group that you're going to talk to more about non-operative care, potentially. Um, biologics, adding PRP or something along those lines. The distal ones are the bad players. It's got the worst blood supply. Um, you get that T sign on MRI and the, the ligament peels off the bone. And the problem there is when it peels off the bone, that joint fluid gets underneath the ligament, right? Joint fluid okay. is a lubricant, right? Once joint fluid gets between the ligament and the bone, it's much more difficult to get that to heal. And it really does just lay down flat distally on the ulna, whereas on the, the proximal insertion on the humeral side, it's a broad fan-shaped insertion. So if you get a partial tear in there, it has more propensity to heal. Like I said, it has a better blood supply. So then, you know, if it's off the humerus or off the ulna and you have good tissue, you're a candidate for a repair. And that seems to be uh, the indications for the repair in this study um, by O'Connell um, et al. that looked at uh, ligament repair with internal brace augmentation in 40 consecutive patients. And they described in their article, actually, um, they described their indications of poor repair was the focal area of ligament injury identified on MRI um, of the proximal end, the distal end, or both with or without a small fragment of bone. And direct inspection. When you get in there and you split the uh, FCU, does it look like a rope, like you're saying, like the LCL? Does it look like a, 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 a um, ATFL, where it's just that's where it's supposed to be, and it's in that it's in that capsule? How does it look? More distinctive or more not specific? So when you whichever way you're getting there, right? Yes. Whether you're splitting the muscle or raising the muscle. The ligament is a, a broad white surface, right? Most of the time, in order to find the tear, and in every technique, you literally split the middle of the anterior band in line with the ligament. Then you inspect it from underneath because that's generally where the tear is. On rare occasions, yeah, it's pulled completely off one side or the other, or and it can come with a fleck of bone. But generally speaking, it's it's a narrow white piece of tissue that looks like a ligament. And most of the time when we see the distal tears, once you split it open, it almost purses, right? Where it should be attached to the bone, it just kind of flops out. So far anteriorly and far posteriorly, it's still attached, but centrally it's pulled off the bone. And then you're able to kind of clean out any devitalized area of tissue, clean up the bone to make a good healing surface, and then move forward with your repair. Excellent. Um, after you do the repair, Dr. Pacey, what is, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this article and their post-operative uh, rehabilitation care, but maybe we should talk about yours first, or uh, you want to go over the, the articles first, your call. Yeah, why don't you go, go through the article, and I'll, we can yeah. talk about what I do that's different. Okay. So at one week, um, they'll put them in a posterior splint, okay, for one week, and then they'll switch to a hinged elbow brace. Um, I don't see the posterior splints uh, up in Westchester anymore or in New York City. Are you using a posterior splint with plaster or no? So we still use a fiberglass posterior splint. You um, do? Okay. A little, a little old school, just for the first 10 days. Um, All right. More than anything, you know, you're making a sizable incision on the medial forearm. Um, if we're doing just a, an isolated repair, no internal brace, it's actually a very small about three, three and a half centimeter incision that we can work through when we're doing a muscle split. Um, but in general, incisions ooze a little bit. There's some blood involved. So I let that first dressing get beat up rather than them having to look, look at everything directly. Um, but usually by 10 days, we move them into the range of motion brace. That being said, with that splint, I want the therapist to take them out of the splint, get eyes on the incision, see how things are doing, and start gentle motion with them, even with a repair at the first and second post-op visits. Again, as I said, I don't see my patients back till 10 to 14 days. So they could have two or three rehab visits in prior to seeing us back. Excellent. Yeah, in the article, they talked about uh, after that one week, putting them, putting them in a hinged uh, elbow brace 
and allowing motion from 60 to 90, and then increasing that motion gradually and by four weeks having full range of motion. Do you expect your patients to have full range of motion at four weeks or so, or does it take, take six? What is your protocol? So at the first post visit, we put them in that range of motion brace, we go 20 to 90. My expectation is that they go 10 degrees a week in each direction. Um, so they're at full extension by week three, week four, and um, full flexion shortly thereafter. I try and get them out of the brace by the six week post-op visit. Um, I don't want them relying on the brace at that point. By six weeks, there should be enough biology, especially with the internal brace in place um, that I'm not concerned. They're gonna self-limit at that point in terms of varus and valgus. But our goal with a repair is to have a ball back, back in their hand at 10 weeks and start their throwing program at 10 weeks. And with the hybrids, we've pushed it to about 12 weeks Whereas with a classic reconstruction, we didn't even think about it until 16 weeks. Right. Uh, this paper speaks, speaks about uh, by six weeks to eight weeks post-operative, the goal is to begin a return to hit and throw program started in the brace. And at 12 weeks, the programs continued without the brace. So they're starting to move it faster, just like your uh, guidelines also. Right. And, and again, with the brace, it depends on what brace you're using. Um, but a, a classic range of motion brace and the reason, the reason guys are comfortable pushing that, a classic elbow range of motion brace actually pushes your elbow, your elbow into varus, right? Because if you think of a, an exaggeration as a gunstock deformity, right? The natural yeah. carrying angle of the elbow is in valgus, right? So you're putting a straight brace on a valgus joint. So it's True. naturally pushing it into varus and, and helping support your repair. So they looked in this study at 45, uh, 45 patients, and the mean age of the patients was, was 35, um, mean age was 17.8 years old, and their follow-up was about 24 months. They did the, uh, they did, they looked at the return to play, how many return to play, they looked at the KJOC score. Do you often use the KJOC score, and do you like that outcome score? I know that we used it, uh, we used it in our practice. It's very baseball specific. Can you speak to the KJOC? The curl and job score? Yeah, the K-Jock score for baseball players is terrific. I mean, some of it's a little um, over the top for the younger athletes, and I know they they came out with a basically K-Jock junior, so to speak, because yeah. in the original K-Jock, it, you know, it talks about um, certain things that are specific to professional athletes, right? So that was always a little bit of an outlier when you look at K-Jock scores, but it is, it's very sensitive for throwers. I think it's a, it's a great um, outcome score, and I collect uh, prospective outcomes measures on all of my surgical patients and in my thrower's protocols um, for shoulder and for elbow, I call it KJOC scores. Excellent. So their study showed that they had a 90, 93% return to play, uh, which is pretty good at a mean level, mean time of seven months. Um, the, the, the quickest was two months. The longest was 12 months in their study. Um, two months, two months is pretty fast. Um, pretty quick. That's pretty quick. But I think, you know, that that lines up very well with what everybody's experience has been for the most part. Um, you know, the the return to play timeline is something that you have to be careful when you look at that, because you can have a patient who is ready to return to play at four and a half or five or six months. But the next season doesn't start for eight or nine months. Right. So, sure. so you're going to look at that number and it's going to be skewed because even though they were ready to throw at six or seven months, right, they don't get to play again until nine months because that's when the season comes. So you have to take a grain of salt with that data. Um, but in general, we quote six to nine months on repairs for pitchers. And certainly, like I said, an infielder. I want them to clear 90 feet in their interval throwing program before they can play anywhere in the infield. Outfielders, I want them through 120 before they can throw in the outfield. And then we go to a, a mound progression from there um, for the pitchers or a, a catcher's progression for, for a catcher. But in general, obviously, those are the, the stages that you go through. But if you, have, if you operate only on infielders, your return to play time is going to be significantly less. If you operate yeah, only on true. pitchers, your return to play time is going to be significantly higher, right? So there's some some patient selection that plays into that as well. 
but unlike the old Tommy John procedures that uh, that the surgeons used to do, the return to play time for that was close to a year and a half before they got onto the field pitching. So Correct. it's much better. We're progressing this. It's much better now. Absolutely. I mean, the power of the internal brace globally, um, what it's done for what we're able to do as sports medicine surgeons is, is just game changing. It's really phenomenal. I just wanted to uh, bring your attention to the subgroup analysis in this, in this article, how they tried to look at location of tear, level of play, use of interoperative PRP injections, or, or concomitant ulnar nerve transpositions. And they really didn't have enough power to detect that there was a difference between the groups in that, in, in the, with regards to those parameters. But um, PRP is something that is out there and is used a lot interoperatively. Do you use it in your, um, or do you use stem cells, or what do you use? Do you use any orthobiologic during your surgery for this uh, procedure? So I'll I'll use PRP non-operatively, um, but I did a Tommy John uh, repair today, so I did a repair with internal brace. There's blood in that field. You're putting suture anchors in yeah. bones, and there is bone marrow dumping out of the bone, covering the UCL. So to me, the addition of PRP, it's a wash at the time of surgery. So generally speaking, I am not a PRP proponent at the time of surgery. Um, will I use PRP postoperatively in certain cases? Sure, a UCL generally is not one of them. It's kind of it's kind of like the ACL reconstruction that you do when they have a meniscus tear, and it does the meniscus tear does so much better because you have all that uh, blood there. Right. I listen. I did a I did a meniscus repair today, isolated. What do you do to add biology? I microfracture the notch and I microfracture the gutter. Sure. Get bone marrow into the joint. Try to recreate that environment of the ACL reconstruction to help that meniscus repair heal. So again, and that's where, you know, using PRP or stem cell at the time of surgery, yeah, there are certain situations where you want to add biology, but there are different ways to do it. If you're doing an osteochondral allograft, there are proponents to using PRP to soak the plugs, proponents to using whole blood to soak the plugs. I have a giant hole in the knee. I stick a jam sheeting needle in it and I take bone marrow out <laughs> and I drill holes in the, the base of the plug and holes in the base of the socket. And I soak the plug in bone marrow and stick the plug in. Guess what? Plenty of biology. It works just fine. Oh, yeah. And I just paid for I paid for a jam sheeting needle. Now, some of the companies that sell PRP and, and BMAC machines may not like that. But at the end of the day, you're adding enough biology that it works. And we just, again, how much more are you going to add to a procedure that's 90% plus success rate? Powering a study to prove that PRP makes a difference when you have a less than 10% failure rate, that's a huge study. That's going to be difficult. Totally. Uh, Rob Shapiro, are you still out there, Rob? Let's welcome in Rob Shapiro. I'm here. Can you? I saw a couple of questions come through. Would you mind uh, reading those for us if possible? I'm going to put glasses on, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, Rob wants to know. Uh, does Dr. Pacey ever use PRP, which we just did? And then um, when can uh, your patients start exercising ro uh, Rob, rotator cuff? It's platelet poor plasma. Oh. So, oh, so Rob, okay. yeah. So PRP <laughs> comes in all shapes and sizes, um, platelet rich, platelet poor. Um, and again, platelet poor, that entire surgical field is doused in plasma right? Yeah. You're splitting a muscle, you're drilling holes in bone. There is every biologic there known to man. And again, my biggest concern, and I've actually, I've seen a few cases of this since COVID. And I, I think there's something that has to do with the hypermetabolic condition that COVID caused. I've seen a few cases of heterotopic bone formation after UCL surgery. And I'm actually in the opposite I'm back to using drains postoperatively. When I was a fellow, we drained everyone. So if I do an ulnar nerve transposition and there's a bigger dissection, I'm using a drain to make sure there's no extra blood in the field. And I'm all of my patients, whether or not we do a nerve transposition on indocent post-op to avoid the risk of heterotopic bone formation. So I'm actually almost to a certain point trying to temper the biologic response rather than add to it. 
And a couple of the cases of HO that I've seen that were not my own cases, they had PRP placed at the time of surgery. So I don't know that that's a smoking gun or not, but anytime you do elbow surgery, there's risk of heterotopic bone formation. I don't want to do anything to make that risk higher. The other question I had is you went through your protocol, you went through motion and throwing. When, when would you be comfortable starting to work with the rotator cuff? So I want you working shoulder motion immediately. Most of these kids come in with an incredibly tight pec and anterior chain musculature, a tight infraspinatus, tight posterior capsule, right? The classic GERD was blamed solely on the, on the posterior capsule. We know it's a bigger thing than that, even though we'll write on a script GERD, right? I see pec minor over function all the time. You, you inhibit the pec, their shoulder blades drop back. That internal rotation comes back like that, right? The shoulder drops right back down into place. Is it all of them? No. We still see Bennett's osteophytes. We st still see posterior capsules that need to be released now and then. But that shoulder really early on should be the primary suspect that you're working on in rehab. Yes, I want you to get the elbow range of motion back, but that's going to come, right? Mm -hmm. And that ligament will heal to work everything else around it. I tell these kids, listen, you have 10 weeks to get your legs in the best shape of your life and your core in the best shape of your life because you're going to have nothing else to do for the next 10 weeks, right? Focus on everything else that you can work during that period. But yeah, you guys should be stretching the shoulder, working on their pec, getting their periscapular musculature back into a, a better place without overstressing my repair, right? But doing what you can to get them in the best biomechanics they've ever been in coming out of this procedure. And also it's an education piece, right? Yeah, your, your elbow's hurt, but this is why it's hurt. And reinforcing how important it is to maintain range of motion, stretch after you throw, do the right thing as part of your throwing program. It's not all about strength, right? It's about balance, it's about motion. Um, and Rob, how much I've learned this from you, but it's, you know, when you're working out as a baseball player, it's working out as a baseball player. I live on Long Island. The beach workout is a thing. Working everything that you see in the mirror and nothing else is a thing. And these kids come in and I look at them and I go, you're turning into a gorilla. We're going to get you a bushel of bananas and send you home. You've got to strengthen your back, right? you got to stretch out your front. Your shoulder blades are almost touching in front of your pecs. You're so bad. You've been on your cell phone too long, right? And I tell them, work their back three to one to their front. So every bench you put up, you should be doing three seated rows or lat pull downs, right? To get that balance and get that open frame and open chest that will get you the biomechanics and get you that extra velo that you want and help prevent injury. But the velo, the velo is the velo is not caused by the rotator cuff muscles. The velo is caused, we generate power from the ground up. Correct. And we should be working the rotator cuff muscles to do what they do what they do and function the way they function. And that centralized the humeral head within the glenoid fossa for 110 pitches a game. Okay. Right. So right. and that's and we know we know when they get tight, right? And their shoulder blade gets internally rotated and that posterior capsule gets tight, mm -hmm. the humeral head raises and goes posterior, which gives us our internal impingement lesions, our slap tears, our partial thickness cuff tears, right? But if you, you focus on balancing the cuff and keeping the humeral head centered, none of those things matter, right? And even if they have a slap, it's no longer symptomatic. That's why we stopped operating on slaps. We can yeah. rehab out of that situation, right? I, when I was a fellow, we operated on almost every slap that came through the door and the return to play rates were like 70%. And we're like, well, we're missing something here, right? And now in my practice, if other than an instability lesion where it's a posterior labral tear that extends superiorly or an anterior that, or a 360, right? An isolated slap in a thrower, I probably do four or five a year. Yes. It's very rare, right? Because I know we can address it without having to do it surgical. Now, you get your motion back, you're still symptomatic, and you've done the time in rehab, yeah, I'll go in and I'll fix your slap or I'll do a biceps tenodesis, and that's, that's a whole nother talk for another time. That right? is, that is. But, but again, the rehab and the prehab is so important. If we could teach these kids what they have to do to maintain. And the other analogy that I use is your car, right? A lot of these teenage kids, they're, they're looking out the window at my office and looking at all the cars in the parking lot 
they're dreaming about what car they're going to own some age. And I say, listen, that's great. You're going to get a car. But if you don't change the oil, right, or you don't change your brakes, or your wheel's out of alignment, you don't take care of it, what happens? The car's going to break down, and you're going to have a beautiful rock sitting in your driveway, right? If you don't maintain it, it's going to be sitting in the driveway and not on the mound. Absolutely. Um, change that air freshener. <laughs> We had another question from uh, someone else, Rob Shapiro. Any thoughts on the use of BFR <laughs> following surgery? Um, so when I, would you start it? So I'm a big BFR component uh, proponent. Um, I'm fine with using it out of the gate as long as you're being smart about how you're using it. And we know that you can put that BFR cuff anywhere um, and see effect, right? So there's crossover. If you put it on the non-operative arm, and you're doing stuff in the operative arm, there is a uh, exocrine effect from the BFR on the opposite extremity. So I'm fine with that. If you're doing lower extremity work, you're doing balance work with them, you're doing core work with them during their rehab of their elbow, put it on their leg. I'm fine with that, right? Um, anything to help get strength back faster uh, um, and in a controlled environment, I'm all for so I have a quick question. We always talk about like healing is healing. So what do we know? When do you think that the internal brace is incorporated? When do you, you know, when do you pretty confident that it's solid or how do you determine so, that? So if we look at <clears throat> ligament healing in general, right? Extra articular ligaments, especially by six to eight weeks, there's a good initial healing response. Um, by 10 weeks, they're starting to mature and to realign. Now, in terms of in what we call incorporating the internal bricks, there's good data to show migration of fibroblasts almost immediately on this collagen dipped tape. It's really spectacular when you look at some of the photomicrographs um, of the, the collagen dipped tape and, and how it works from a Petri dish to animal models and things along those lines. And I think that one of the reasons that this procedure has been so successful is that scaffold that comes with the tape, but also the mechanical support that the tape gives because what it's going to allow the ligament to do, and we've got good videos of this with, with ACLs in the lab being backed up by internal brace. It allows the, the ligament to see stress and then the internal brace gradually picks up and supports the ligament as it stretches beyond where you'd like it to, so to speak. So it's seeing enough stress that there's going to be the impetus for biologic healing without stress shielding, but also supporting it enough that you're not going to overstretch the ligament. So it's going to be allowed to heal where it's supposed to. And I think that's why we're able to get to that point that much faster. Additionally, you know, when you put a free graft in, that free graft has to vascularize and incorporate. And that vascularization step and that initial healing step takes longer. And for it to incorporate, it takes longer. So that's where the hybrid technique, you're doing a repair, a reconstruction, and adding an internal brace, right? I think that's where we're, we're seeing that we can kind of split the difference there um, and be more aggressive because you've done a repair. And the reason that you're adding a graft is either that the ligament damages more. So one of my indications now is some of these kids, when they get hurt, when they're younger, they'll ossify part of the proximal ligament. So occasionally in a high school or college kid, they'll come in and they'll tear their proximal ligament, but there's a chunk of bone sitting in the proximal ligament from their injury, probably when they were in elementary school, right? But when you go to do a repair on that, you take that piece of bone out. Now you've got a big defect in the tendon. So for me, or in the ligament rather, there's a big defect in the ligament. So for me, I want to add collagen beyond just the tape in that situation. So that's where I'll do a hybrid to backfill where that gap is for the piece of bone, but also then be able to do a primary repair and add the internal brace. So you kind of get the best of all worlds. So it might be a basic question. So I don't, the internal brace goes all the way, the whole ligament. Or is it? Is there a chance where the ligament and the internal yep. brace go that that spans? Can tear? Spans? No, it spans completely across from the humerus to the ulna. Okay, so there's no spot that it could kind of 
be really strong here, but not as strong where it, another component no, it's, of it, it's, right? It's, uh, it's, it's equal completely along the length of the leg. Was there, another, was there another question, Rob? I think there is. Jason Blum, um, when do you allow um, a patient to, I can't even say, time for glasses, unless Don's going to say, hold on. Ah, <laughs> when do you allow uh, the trail arm versus arm, trail arm versus the lead arm UCL repairs start to return to golf programs? So again, I, I try and slow play golf depending on the time of year. Earlier in the season, later in the season, when things are hard and the ground is hard, I try and slow play them a little bit more because the last thing I want is, you know, the trail arm to chunk one, right? Which is classic golfer's elbow setup. Um, so, you know, we start a hitting program usually around that 10, 12 week mark, sometimes a little bit earlier, depending on where they are um, seasons wise. So I try and kind of follow the hitting program timeline um, to start a return to golf program. Makes sense. Dr. Pace, the last thing I wanted to bring up was the, uh, the, the presentation we saw last year's, uh, this last year's AOSSM. Functional outcomes of primary ulnar collateral ligament repair with internal brace in athletes. And it was presented by Emily Arciero. And she essentially looked at the exact surgery you just described in 56 patients. And uh, it was it was very nice to see that she has similar surgery results to you. There were there were 39 partially torn uh, UCLs, 17 were fully torn, but she had a 91% success rate with with uh, with their um, a return to play in the recon in the uh, repaired UCL. So very similar to, to your not a hundred percent like you, but uh, I'm 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 sure ninety one is uh is pretty good unless you're those four patients that had reoperations. Right. Um, but, but, have... but again, I mean if you look at those numbers, who had an opportunity in that ten yes. percent who didn't, right? It's a Absolutely. lot of this patient patient selection, like I said before. So it's anything above 90% is a success. Maybe, maybe there was a fellow who was a pro athlete, you know what? And he got caught because they took a guy that cost less for the professional team or the minor league team. So there's a lot of, when you're looking at outcomes, you're looking at things of that sort of nature. There's a lot of factors that go into it besides the athlete's uh, performance. I, I had a patient who we got back for his senior year of high school and he played a senior year of high school and was playing, playing college. And he got into flight school. And yeah. That was it. His baseball career was over because he got into flight school and he couldn't do the flight training program and play baseball. Right. So you, sure. you can't account for those situations in research papers. No, you can't. It is 855. And I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight on the sports medicine research rundown. Um, next week, we'll have Dr. Mark Zolan talking about talking about uh, athletic pubalgia now next week, I'm, excuse me, next month. And uh, you're, you're a rock star. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, have a great night. Okay. Tim and Rob, Thank you, Dr. I, I appreciate, you, appreciate you having me on. And uh, this was a terrific discussion. And I really appreciate what you guys do for education, for physical therapists and physicians alike and athletic trainers. And um, really appreciate the great relationship I've had with professional over the years and, and look forward to keeping it going. Thank, Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Have a Thanks great so day. Much tonight, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Pacey.